change gears a little bit. Uh, my talk is uh, not in the cloud or in the network, but deep inside the boxes, either at the edge or in the data center at the process level. So before we start, uh, how many people here are software designers? Developers? How about hardware? How about hardware developers? Okay, great. Anybody ever design LASIK? Yeah. So, um, I'm going to start with a couple of uh, really quick introductions around what's happening here. And this is a, this is a topic that um, is probably not exactly what you'd expect to see at a Syngen event, but fundamentally, our pro processor space, the industry, is changing quite a bit. Everybody in the room is familiar with Linux, and it's an absolute no-brainer, that's the operating system that all the servers around the world and most data centers run. Well, that wasn't always the case. Like proprietary OSs were in place well before uh, Linux was in place. And there's a, a little bit of a revolution underway in the semiconductor industry, specifically around processor architectures. If you're familiar with x86, that's what's on the laptop. If you're familiar with ARM, that's what's on the mobile device. You may have never heard of a thing called RISC-V. Uh, but RISC-V is going to do to microprocessors and the architectures of computing platforms what Linux has done in the server space. There we go. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, it was actually, I was thrilled to see in Ray's talk, he actually mentioned x86 and mentioned ARM and mentioned the instruction set. Right? So an instruction set architecture is literally the list of instructions that a microprocessor runs. I'm going to give you a little bit of history on the processor space and what's happened and why this is going on. I'm going to give you a quick introduction to RISC-V and then talk about the challenges of open source IP. Why don't we get rid of this? I'm not going to use it. Okay, thanks. Nice. Uh, the challenges of open source IP in the hardware space. Software industry to solve these problems. And then talk about a, a nonprofit organization uh, that, that I'm running uh, uh, in this space. So, 40 years ago, right, the microprocessor really was, uh, was, was brought into everyday life kind of thing. You know, most of us, when you first get graduated at school, you probably had a computer on your desk with a chain to it. It was running an x86 uh, CPU, um, probably from, from Intel, called a SIS machine, Complex Instruction Set Computing. And there was also a, another architecture around called RISC, Reduced Instruction Set Computing. Then in the 90s, you know, Moore's Law came along, and you probably heard about that a little bit, but you know what, a geometry strengths in the semiconductor space make everything go faster. That's great, we all love it. A little more power, we don't really care. We just clock up, you know, increase the clock rate, everything goes faster, we get more throughput, hallelujah. The architecture fundamentally didn't change, though. It was actually a pretty lazy way of getting performance improved. The physics changed because it was a new geometry strength, um, but the fundamental architecture didn't change. There was more instruction level parallelism running in these things, but fundamentally the CPUs didn't change too much. The shrinking kept on in the 2000s, you know, billions of transistors on a wafer. And then today, the explosive growth that we're seeing in network capacity with 5G, and I'll talk about that in a bit, and, and the impact of higher and higher performing applications uh, to drive machine learning, AI, IoT, and so on, it's changing fundamentally how processors and computing platforms need to be architected. And worse than that, the gravy train that we were on from Moore's Law is done. <coughs> we're, we are at the physics limit of silicon as a semiconductor to, to generate more performance throughput. So all of these networks that we're deploying and everything and making it easy to service and all that good stuff, that's great. Fundamentally, the semiconductor industry is going to have a real hard time delivering new processors with higher and higher capacity unless we fundamentally change the architecture. So, yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all lovely. You know, this this first part could be uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, AR, VR, AI, IoT. It's like I'm doing my PowerPoint for uh, for a, a VC firm or something. You put those buzzwords in in your PowerPoint and you get the money, but. What's really happening here is that 5G from a, from a networking speed standpoint will really unleash a whole new level of performance, assuming everything can keep up. 
And if you're talking about a deeply embedded IoT device right out of the edge that you might actually want to have installed for five years and not worry about, there's a power consideration for that system that today's processing platforms can't deliver on. But by power, I mean supply power, not performance. And you've seen all of these trends uh, before. Uh, it's, it's all very, very real and very nice. And all of the CPU vendors, ARM, Intel, and, and anything based on those, will tell you how they're going to get there. But fundamentally, the architectures that they have to, to offer you are, are not, going to, not going to deliver the performance that they're expecting. Why is that? Well, these, these architectures are, are very, very good, but they're quite old. And, and to be an, have an x86 compliant device, you need to implement all of the instructions that are in that list of, of instructions, uh, instructions to, to be able to ensure that you can run the same binaries and execute the same, the same program. And that might not be very effective if you're trying to architect something that is purpose-built and tailored for the data set that you're, that you're trying to manage. Well, there's five, and that's the Roman numeral five, not a B is a fifth generation of risk architecture research that came out of Berkeley. So five years ago, I was working with the team at Berkeley and we started the Risk 5 Foundation. There's more than 230 companies now around the world that are investing in Risk 5 architecture. Every single one of your hardware vendors and, and chip vendors, if you're a hardware developer, is playing with Risk 5 today. And you need to know about it because it is coming. And it's free and open. And if you think about even laptop, and, and all the standards and networking. Virtually every major interface in the system that we look at today is open. It's an open source implement, it's an open technology, uh, the, the specification is at least. And the ISA up until now hasn't been. The risk five is changing that. Okay, so that's the processor history standpoint. Now we're all, you're all CPU experts. So what, what, is, what is risk five? If you look at any modern SOC system on a chip, there's actually multiple cores in an SOC, some of which are exposed with APIs to the programmer, many of which are not. They're just embedded controllers that are part of the firmware. And they can be implementing the radio DSPs and the audio DSPs and so on, or they can be image processors, the application processor. And from a historical standpoint, an integration standpoint, they're all using different ISAs, either ARM-based ARM uh, ISAs or PowerPC, or some homegrown stuff because it's a, a small little controller. And they existed in a discrete implementation and they were just integrated. And that's how the SOCs were built. And it's, it's a nightmare to maintain. Certainly they don't have to all be proprietary, but if it was a free one, and that's what RISC 5 is about. You can go to RISC5.org and learn a lot more about the ISA and, and how it's architected. But fundamentally, it's a modular ISA. Each each set of uh, instructions is broken down into, uh, grouped into particular functions, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, that allows you to create an extensible device that is tailored specifically for the data payload that you're trying to manage. Here's a list of the extensions. I'm not going to go through this because I can imagine based on nobody in the room has ever done a chip, uh, but all the hands went down. Um, this, this stuff is probably not that interesting. Uh, but Suffice it to say that uh, the, when I said earlier, the fifth generation of risk architecture research out of Berkeley, the, um, it's, 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 it's pretty interesting to have 20 years of hindsight of what worked well in processor architectures and what hasn't worked well. One of the reasons for the extensibility is to allow for different architectures at the CPU level. Everybody's probably heard of Spectre and Meltdown, right? Oh, well, it was all scary shit. And, sorry. Um, and it, it is, and fundamentally, it doesn't matter what ISA you're running, everybody's CPU is vulnerable to Spectre and Meltdown because of everybody's CPU is architected fundamentally the same way. There's a prefetch window that happens. I'm not going to get into the details of how Spectre and Meltdown works, but without new architectures, we're not going to be able to A, address the data payloads, or B, come up with different security techniques to overcome these, these vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown. So, for those of you that are old and gray like me, I want to walk you through, for, to illustrate the simplicity of the ISA, the, uh, 
We used to, if you were playing with a deck machine like a PDP-8 or PDP-11 and, and the bootstrap switches on the front, you had an assembly card of all the assembly instructions that machine would run. And it was called a green card for no other reason that it were originally printed on green cardboard. So I'm going to build a green card for the Respite Bias A. These are all of the instructions for 32-bit integer uh, functions. Add 14 more for privilege mode. Add another 8 for multiply divides. Add another 11 for atomic, so we can modify rates. And all the floating point uh, of different widths. Add another 46 for compressed mode. And then do it all again for uh, 32, 64, and 128 widths. And one more click, and there's your green card. It might be hard to read in the back of the room, uh, but you can actually print this out on a normal 8.5 by 11 sheet and have all the instructions. And this is far more simple than you would see in, a, in an ARM ISA spec or, or x86 spec. All right, so now we, we're experts in the processor industry. Now you know all about open, open instruction set architectures. Uh, let's talk about open source design at the chip level, at the IC level, and what, what the challenges are with that. So the open source paradigm in the software industry has been around for a long time and everybody's really comfortable with it. It works really well. It's well established. There is not a single high volume production piece of silicon that implements any uh, of its design using open source hardware today. Not, there's nothing that you can point to. And there's a whole variety of reasons for that. Fundamentally, verification the actual software around uh, developing a chip, the physical design and verification, let alone the actual SOC design, that accounts for the more than 90% of the cost of doing an SOC. Um, one of the challenges is if you have highly differentiated IP in your, in your, in your SOC, then it's warranted to make that investment. But if you've got a 32-bit core or a 64-bit core, just like everybody else's 64-bit core, then there's no differentiation in the core. Why do you need to keep investing your own money in, in doing that? Why can't there be open source implementations uh, to bring those costs down? From a business standpoint or strategy standpoint, the quality of that IP is kind of, kind of dangerous, right? If you uh, if you think of it this way, uh, the mass set to produce a chip is somewhere between 10 and 100 million dollars, depending on, um, on what geometry you're in. So you're going to you know, go into your boss's office, get your badge on a piece of IP that you downloaded from GitHub, and you will put that into the chip because you, know, you can't fix the chip once it's in the field. There's no software patch you can upload. Maybe you can get around the button. The other part is people ecosystems. Like, okay, great, there's a nice piece of code I downloaded, but is there really an ecosystem to support it? And then from a business and legal standpoint, there's a lot of IP wrapped up in the semiconductor industry. So permissive open source licensing is the only model that will actually really work. And RISC V has, at least at the spec level, brought the potential of the open source paradigm to CPU design. Uh, Chris and I can start a processor company in his kitchen tomorrow and use RISC-V, but we don't have to talk to anybody. There's no licensing, there's no lawyers to get involved, it's great. But how many implementations, and that's a fantastic for, for uh, innovation, but how many implementations does the industry really need to, uh, to be able to leverage this forward? Um, from an innovation standpoint, more is better. From a support standpoint, there is a number that's too many because the industry won't have to be able to develop critical mass to support all of these implementations. So just as an example, this is a, a, a couple of months old now, but I took this as a snapshot off the RISC-V.org site that talks about all the different uh, RISC-V processor implementations that are out there. Some are proprietary, and many of these ones are open source. And there's more coming. And more isn't necessarily better. What I've highlighted here is a couple of implementations that came out of an organization in a uh, university in Zurich called ETH Zurich. Uh, probably nobody's heard of it. It's one of the largest engineering schools in Europe. It's where Albert Einstein went to school. And their processor implementations have actually uh, seen, it, seen some <coughs> interesting traction in the, in, the, uh, in the industry. 
So that's what I'm talking about now with our open hardware group in 4.5. So open hardware group is a nonprofit open source organization that is curating uh, open, open implementations for people to be able to use uh, in, in their systems. And the core five family of cores, um, the initial seeds anyway, are those two cores that I just showed you, and I'll have some more info on that in a moment. Lots of interesting companies are involved in this. Uh, there's, there's more behind this, but these companies have uh, agreed to be public about their involvement. We have over 20 companies uh, that are part of the Open Hardware Group. Uh, I'm sure you recognize some of the names here, hopefully most of them. We also have a really good uh, set of partners and uh, um, to, to, you know, to help us help us build up the organization. It's headquartered here in Ottawa, and I spent most of my life in different parts of the world. I live here, I went to school here, I grew up here, I was born here, and I'm kind of annoyed at the fact that I spend most of my time in other regions talking about this kind of technology and not enough of it here. So, uh, sorry to subject you to a processor talk at SEMGEN, but uh, I'm pretty excited to be only happy to uh, drive out to Canada to do it. So, we have a really broad ecosystem right now that's, that's underway. Uh, certainly be interested in talking to any of the hardware companies in the room if, if you're interested in learning more about the, uh, about the initiative. Um, we have resources here in Ottawa, in, in Zurich, uh, and in Shanghai. And as I said earlier, ETH Zurich is a platform uh, called Pulp. Uh, the university architected these cores, and, and it's a, we have a 32-bit and 64-bit core. I've got block diagrams here that I'm not going to spend any time on, but they'll be in the slides if you're really curious. And <laughs> these cores have seen silicon since 2015. So they've been implemented in a number of different geometries. There's a lot of maturity behind these cores. And they're being adopted commercially by uh, a handful, a number of companies right now. There's, there's not announcements yet, but they're coming. This is a little development board that came out of the NXP organization. Um, and in fact, uh, last month we ran a workshop down at Invest Ottawa where we gave away 100 of these things and started to show people you know, development tools that, that are, uh, have been put in place uh, for RISC V. So that's the Core 5 family. What are we up to? Well, it's an open organization. We have a board of directors that runs the organization on behalf of the members. We have a technical working group deriving a features and functionality like any open standard would and a marketing working group to talk, you know, get us in front of organizations like this. The, uh, the board is shown here, some, some big companies, some small companies, international in, in scope with Alibaba and, Ver and VeraSilicon, both large Chinese companies. Bit of a eye chart in terms of the ecosystem. Again, you'll have this uh, in the slides when you when you want to, uh, if you want to look further. But the point of this is that this is everything from the chip design right through to putting eval boards and development kits in people's hands, so that the uh, so that you know people can can take advantage of of these risk five implementations. And I think oh no, I've got one one other thing I want to show you. One of the things that we talked about earlier was uh, am I going to bet my badge, throw my badge down on my boss's desk and say, hey, yeah, I just what to get them? You've got this processor core. Let's put it in our chip. It'll work. Hallelujah. Uh, so we, you know, in the, our technical working group, um, one of the task groups that we have is a verification task group, and um, that task group is responsible for putting together an open source verification test bench for these cores. It's running on uh, IBM Cloud. Uh, uses a, a random instruction generator developed uh, by Google. All of the stimulus, whether it's directed random or uh, the compliance testing, is all open source. The commercial simulators that we run on are commercial tools, because that's what the semiconductor industry uses. But this is a very interesting project. And one of the, um, one of the companies here locally in Ottawa called Metrix uh, is an author of the actual simulator that we use. So it's, it's a very uh, cool initiative. The semiconductor industry doesn't do things this way. Uh, so it's a bit of a... It's, it's a cool piece of innovation. 
this is my last slide. So as I said earlier, it's a legally registered nonprofit, right? We have a footprint across across the globe. We launched the organization in June and have attracted close to 25 now members and, and partners. Uh, there's lots of um, lots of information on our site. As well, you can follow us on the traditional social media sites. That's me. Any questions? Instructions that are specific for like an NPU, uh, a network processor, or, or, or yeah, yeah. So the, uh, the the standard set of extensions is just generic computing, um, and there's certainly um, task groups uh, looking at different end, end, like end markets that will develop a standard set, a standard extension uh, depending on those end markets. There isn't a networking one yet. Uh, another part of the instruction set is that there's a, a reserved opcode space for user-defined instructions. So you can roll your own custom set of, you know, uh, based on your own algorithm, uh, your own set of instructions, and put, put them in there. But there will be, there are a bunch of NPU designs today that use a, risk, a, a you know, sort of a standard risk like core with custom set of instructions sitting alongside it. So there will be a standard um, NPU-like set of Instructions going into an extension at some point. That's not active right now. Yeah. Another question in the back. How much time do we have for questions? Well, one or one. Two. So Intel and ARM, for example. For, for example. So uh, let's go. No, uh, fair point. Uh, so my job when I was running the Spy Foundation was to talk to everybody in the industry, and, and I did that. Um, and I can tell you that every single semiconductor company on the planet has a Spy project. In play. You don't have to be a member of an organization to use the open source. Uh, specification. Um, whether they choose to publicize what they're doing or not, that's up to them. Um, specifically about, uh, you asked about Intel, ARM, and Bohan. Um, if you saw one of the recent announcements that ARM made, uh, they've actually just now added user-defined extensions to the ARM ISA. Uh, partly in recognition of the fact that what's going on in the this 5 space is actually a, a, a real thing. I'll, I'll move it at that. So this is either your best question or your worst question. You had a geometry 65 nanometer, which is like 10 years old. And I didn't notice anything at the 10 and 7 nanometer levels. So, hey, I want a cutting edge design. Intel and AMD are fighting each other on per performance, uh, instructions for clock, performance per watt, and you want me to go to a 10-year-old technology that's going to consume a factor of 10 more power? So, a couple of things. Um, some of the assertions you made, I would uh, challenge um, in terms of the, pa the power consumption. Um, but if you notice, there are other, not 10, but 22 uh, nanometer nodes here. All of this was university-based. Um, that, uh, all of this work was university-based, right? So they cannot afford 10 nanometer mass sets, or seven for that matter. The other aspect is, to make those architectures go faster, the only way they can do it is by trying to push harder on, on, on geometry nodes. That's it. Because uh, architecturally, there's really not a whole lot of innovation that they can bring to the table at this stage. Uh, risk five changes that paradigm, where you'll be able to get uh, uh, tailored, workload-specific benefits at much older technologies that are much cheaper, 
and it won't be consuming the same power. Your power assertion statement is based on running the old architecture at the, on those nodes. So is your performance per watt comparable? Yes. Given, at a given geometry? Yes. Uh, actually, far better. And uh, we're talking about the ISA versus an implementation of the ISA. So you, you can you can take a good ISA and, and create a bad implementation and it'll be terrible. So that's more of an implementation question. But the simplicity of the ISA make, allows you to tailor it specifically to the ISA. 